Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for watching another episode of my show. Uh, and of course, we're chatting with Colleen Jack again today. And today, she's going to share with us how to audit a pattern. So over to you, Colleen. Thanks, Millie. And so this is where I want to encourage people who feel that they are not pattern makers that just because they haven't been trained as a pattern maker doesn't mean that they cannot take control of a pattern that they have paid for and often at, at huge expense. And so we're gonna go through just a couple of the landmarks um, in order to find where we are on a pattern. And then I will show you physically how to order to pattern. So uh, just a question, Colleen, if somebody is looking for a good pattern maker, to make their patterns. How do you recommend they go about finding that pattern maker? Drop me a mail. I have a database of um, digital pattern makers and manual pattern makers that I have audited over the years. And hopefully after today, if you don't feel like contacting me, then you've got enough tools to actually um, employ a pattern maker with confidence. And, and um, for people who are just starting out, which is better, somebody who makes patterns manually or someone who makes them digitally? So manually, and I'm a manual pattern maker. Um, I was trained manually back in the day before there were computers. Um, but manually, you then have your physical RP. Um, if you're going digitally, you would need to trust that pattern maker that they will um, protect your RP on, on, your, on, their pat, on their computer. And you would be relying on them to then print out um, markers for you to use at the CMT. But I always recommend that once you've gone through um, and you have a production ready pattern, that you ask the digital pattern maker to print you off a copy that you could then cut out and keep in your um, offices safely. Um, you know, things happen, relationships go south, and then if they refuse to um, release your, your, your patterns, you, you're a bit stuck, because it is sitting on, on their computer, and possession is nine tenths of the law. Um, also, really trust that the digital pattern maker is trustworthy, because if you spent a fortune developing your blocks and the, the fit sits in the block um, that they are not going to then reuse that fabulous block uh, for somebody else's patterns. Okay, that's very useful information. Thank you. So I know a lot of home pattern makers use like tissue paper. I personally, that would drive me insane. Um, it's very unwieldy to work with. They shift when you're tracing them off onto the fabric. And so I prefer a hardboard, um, which comes in a 120 centimeter width in about 120 gram um, per square meter. And I buy it in about 30 kilogram rolls. And I like working on 150 centimeters because it's the same width as a fabric would be. And so I can judge already by the, the paper waste whether or not that's gonna be a good rating before I've even laid it up to do a rating. Um, and so that's available from our haddock in, in Johannesburg. And you can go online and also just look them up. They do have a website. Um, as always, I'm very pedantic about the scissors. So only use your paper scissors for paper and your fabric scissors for fa fabric. And, um, and then of course, always have duct tape handy. Um, I found that if you use masking tape, it does perish over the years. And so um, your working pattern can disintegrate. But also, uh, you know, duct tape, depending on the quality, will also disintegrate. And so once you have finished um, your master pattern and you now have a production-ready pattern, I would also want the pattern maker to trace off a totally new piece without any sticky, um, you know, back or anything like that. Um, I know this seems so ridiculous, but do invest in a very good clutch pencil with a steel nib. So this is not plastic, this is all steel. And the reason why I say that, and all internal metal parts, is that 
if you use a lead pencil or horror a, a pen, um, as the nib of the pencil gets blunted, the pencil will not reach the edge of the ruler. And so eventually you will become inaccurate. And, you know, two millimeters inaccurate over sizes will become grossly inaccurate. And maybe we should do a talk about grading. Um, okay. Actually grading. Okay. Um, and when I was taught, um, we, we used a pencil that was always rubbed off. Um, so you must have an eraser. And it's about receiving a pattern that has got very little um, markings on it. Just shows that a pattern maker has taken extreme um, pride in their work. And also that you don't give away your trade secrets on how you develop that pattern. Um, when I show you the pattern today, you'll see that it's got a lot of pencil markings. And um, in some instances, the pattern maker actually used a pen, which is just crazy and you can see all of her feathered lines um, afterwards. That's just scrappy work. Do invest in, in a isosceles triangle um, ruler. These Perspex rulers are fantastic and there is a lot of information on them. So um, you've got a 90 degree line that's clearly marked with numbers going from 1 to 20 outwards. And so you can make sure that um, if you're working on darts, two sides of a darts are, are always equidistant. The increments here on the side are excellent for grading because the, the average grade is a five centimeter grade. And of course it has the fainter line for a half centimeter. The other thing that most people don't know is that um, the, the line marking on the, the, the ruler is actually marked for two millimeter increments, seven millimeter increments, and one centimeter increments. And so you can take off the beading on a collar so that those collars roll very beautifully by using the two millimeter um, lines. And then of course you can add on centimeter seam allowance or seven mil seam allowance very easily by using your ruler accurately. So do learn how to use a ruler accurately. Um, the next thing is I do not recommend a tracing wheel. These are my horror. And it just tells me that the pattern maker is naive. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One, it's a waste of time because you've got to trace the whole line before you're transposing it. And there are better ways to transpose pattern lines or style lines. So I use an awl and it only pricks one mark into that paper pattern. And so your pattern is also not ruined with um, a whole lot of perforations. And then of course you do need a notcher and a notcher is used to indicate um, seam allowance, sewing directions, and of course balance notches. Um, so a finished pattern should contain all the signs and symbols to make it easy to assemble that garment. Um, there should be a clear system that is consistent, ensuring that anyone who picks up your pattern, no matter what CMT is working on it, will be able to follow your instructions and also make sure that there are enough um, information on, on that pattern. You will really find a CMT who is prepared to work with like a Butterick or a Burda pattern. And again, that paper patterns will drive anyone insane in a factory. Um, so all common instructions on the patterns I would recommend are in a black marker, in Debable Ink marker. So you're not trying to fiddle with a fine pen, um, writing and of course wherever there's something that needs your attention in the cutting room we want it in the, in red on the on the pattern and then of course um, all those patterns have got the designer's um, name uh, a chronological number and so if it was the first pattern created for that designer it, it would be 001 and say we're in 2020 so the pattern style number will be 001 stroke 20. Um, when you receive a pattern, um, anything that is on the fold should be on the fold because factories don't lay fabric folded, they lay fabric open. And so all patterns must be on the fold. Um, and your fold line will become your straight of grain. So your SOG is, is, is along the straight of grain. And then we want pattern cutting instructions with a little technical drawing um, at the top here. So is it a woven or a knit? 
What is your style number? What is the size? What is the pattern piece's name? Your cutting instructions, and then of course any other instructions like fusing, contrast, or, or wadding, or whatever. And then of course if there are extra instructions like how big the elastic needs to be. And I want the, the notches indicating seam allowance, stitching direction, and balance notches. And I will go into balance notches are uh, instruction that talks on behalf of you to a machinist. And so two notches indicate back patterns, one notch indicates a front pattern, and it will give a, a machinist a sewing length to match that they know that the seams are sewing up correctly so they don't have to then unpick afterwards. And so normally they are at about waist point, bust point, and um, the sewing directions will tell the machinist whether or not they are sewing the armhole closed and the shoulder closed before they are setting the pipe of the sleeve or are they going to sew the shoulder set the sleeve and then close the sleeve and the underarm um, and the waist all at once if you have um, a simple pattern then it's pretty easy when you're naming the pattern that this is the bodice front or that is a bodice back or this is side front um, body panel or back side body panel but here i'm using an example of of one of clive's fantastic designs and there it gets really really tricky these are all the same pattern this is made in tulle this is made in fabric um, with old swatch boards that we we collected all the old swatches of uh, um, and sewed them into the seams and this is, of course, where he has used um, 100,000 staples to create embellishment on a very plain black fabric in, in underneath. And how this pattern works is it's like um, unpeeling an orange. And so there are no side seams and the garment simply wraps around. And that is very, very complex to sew. And so here what I've done is given it names um so top front right shoulder and then given it numbers one two three four five six seven and it goes up to 28 or a b c d e f g and so the the machinist is then knowing that they are matching a to b b to c c to d e to f um because this pattern was so complex i then made a cardboard pattern and um, glue, uh, you know, stuck it together with, with brown tape with clearly markings of where A was, where B was, where C was. And so the machinist could actually hold a three-dimensional cardboard representation of what they were saying. Any questions here? That dress is something else. That must have been quite a thing to work on. <laughs> the mind boggles. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that is a, a, a time study of note. Um, yeah, that, that becomes a very expensive um, production. Exercise, yeah. And just for people watching, Colleen uh, has referred to Clive. That's Clive Rundle. And we do have permission from Clive Rundle to use these photos. Oh, please thank him so much for that. That's awesome. Always. Um, okay, so straight of grain is your SOG. It uses the hang of the fabric as part of the design. And that is usually on the lengthwise of, of a fabric. So you've got salvages on either end and you're using the long side of, of the fabric. Sometimes for special decorative effects, a garment is cut on the horizontal grain. Uh, so the horizontal grain. And that would be for like a contrast on the waist facing or um, a hem detail or a placket on a shirt. And just know that that fabric must be very stable, both on the, the, the weft and the warp of the, the grain. Otherwise, you can have problems. If it is not stable and you still want to use the horizontal, I would recommend that you fully fuse that to stabilize it before you use that. Um, cutting on the bias is often uh, for a decorative effect. It is always around drape for fit. And it can be done beautifully. The 90s, 30s use drape um, bars cutting often in their styling, but do know that it is more expensive. Um, I like SOGs to indicate 
on the center front all the way through. So I want a long red line. I don't want just a little um, line in the middle of a pattern. And what happens is, is that if the SOG is a short line, it often creates inaccuracies when people are tracing off the pattern in the, in the cutting room. Um, so pattern pieces that have been split away from obvious landmarks like a center front will follow parallel across the width. And anyone who um, follows my patterns, I'm pedantic about keeping that parallel width exactly the same. And so if it's a side body panel, you'll often find that my side body panel is about 13 centimeters away from the SOG of the center front. Um, but that's me just being anal. Um, yeah, so when the cutting room is laying up those pattern pieces, they will use their SOG parallel to the salvage of the of the fabric and so a long lovely red line gives them a lot of ways to check the accuracy and um yeah patterns can twist as you as you trace them off if they're not properly weighted down so stitching lines and seams production pattern makers will always include a one centimeter seam allowance and I would never accept a pattern without seam allowance. Um, the, the waste of time then for the cutting room to add seam allowance is yeah, inconceivable. So I would never pay for a pattern without seam allowance. And you would use on a knit, so that's normally for woven one centimeter seam allowance. On knits, we normally add a seven mil seam allowance and that's because that's the, the bite of a full thread overlocker. Unless, of course, that garment is being produced on a safety stitcher, a five thread overlocker with a chain stitch, then you would go back to a one centimeter seam allowance. And then if you are working on bespoke patterns um, with a different market in mind, like private clients, we would normally use a 12 milli or a 1.5 milli seam allowance so that if the client loses weight or gains weight, we have got a little bit of leeway on a bespoke once off garment. Um, darts are marked with notches um, at the bottom of the dart and then of course at the depth of the dart normally there's a little triangle cut out so you can trace it off with chalk but most CMTs would use a tungsten needle and so we normally just punch an all mark um, a few millimeters from the apex of the, the dart and they will actually drill a tungsten needle right through the lay of a hundred um, garments to get the accurate pinpoint of that dot. Um, so notches make it easier to assemble a, dock, uh, a garment quicker and for accuracy. Um, and then the machinist is not having to make constant decisions about do I overlock this off? Did I make it right? Did that seam line actually fit? Um, notches on commercial patterns are normally indicated by little triangles or diamonds. Um, let me tell you in a factory, they are never going to cut out that little triangle or diamond. And so when we cut out a pattern, we actually cut into that notch so that it's cut into that seam allowance. And of course, a factory will know that if you're working with um, like a really gossamer loose weave silk, that they won't cut the notches in. They would then mark the notches with chalk or, or pins. But you will be charged for that because that is a chafafal and it will take so much longer to do. Um, and as I said, single notches indicate a front of a garment, double notches at a back. And um, when you are making balance notches, make sure that the balance is, is always like one third of the line. Because if you make the notches sort of in the middle of that cut pattern piece, you could then reverse the pattern and get that panel together um, with mat and match those notches. So notches are always a little bit off um, even you know, on, on, a, on a stitching line. They're always, you know, a third of the way down or a third of the way up, so you could never reverse the panel pieces. And so that gets us to, through the PowerPoint, and now I will um, show you a, an audited pattern that cost a designer a fortune, and she was um, very generous to, to um, donate the pattern to us. So there was a use for this pattern after all. And so um, when we know better, we will do better. So this is not a criticism on the pattern maker. This is being able to see that you have bought a pattern from a naive pattern maker who hasn't yet got robust um, structures in place. And so 
the first thing that I would recommend that you do is if you are paying for a, a, a pattern. Sorry, I would to, want to, to stop you, Colleen, uh, is the PowerPoint meant to be closed? Yes. I can so still can see it. Yes. I just think Sorry. it would be, there we go. Now people have got a bigger picture of what you're doing there. So um, I always want a technical drawing and I want the, the, the pattern named. This is not good naming. Um, the nomenclature here, you've got no size on any of the pattern pieces. So I want to know what size I'm working with and I want to know if this is a woven or a knit. Um, I can't tell you how many times I had somebody phone me saying that pattern you made me last year that went through production on the poly cotton for our shirting doesn't fit anymore. Well, the pattern hasn't changed. What did you cut it in this year? Oh, we cut it in knit. Mm. No, no, no. It's a woven pattern. You can't cut a woven pattern in knit. Mm. And you can't cut a knit pattern in woven. Mm. It will never work. Mm. Um, so you will always find it with a rabbit hole punch. I don't like a rabbit um, punch. It just it jars me. So I'll end up cutting out little diamonds so that the patterns can be hung up. And the, the, there's a few problems on this. First of all, this SIG is not actually in line with the center front. It makes no sense to have a center, a, 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 an SIG not doing double duty, like telling me where a center front is. So that's the first problem. Second problem that you can immediately see is that the shoulder line does not end at a 90 degrees. That is going to create a diamond when we sew it. And this balance notch is absolutely useless. If a machinist cannot sew 17 centimeters straight, we've got a problem, Houston. The next thing is, is that I simply staple the patterns together. And if a pattern maker had a hissy fit about me stapling a pattern in front of them, then the ego has got in the way. And so the easiest way to do this is work out that you've got one centimeter seam allowance. And if you lay the patterns on top of each other, draw a two centimeter line along um, from the one centimeter from the edge of the pattern draw two centimeters and so you can flat fill the patterns over and so you can see here that i have laid it over two centimeters and i've stapled it down and so when you hold the pattern up you will see it's already buckling so you've got a a, a huge um, bust shape and you have a curved waist. The pattern is already showing you its discomfort. The other thing is that the two lines of the dart are not equidistant. And that is a golden rule. You are always working for every action, there's an equal but opposite reaction. And so if you are stretching the, the dart here, it can be done in couturier wear. But I can tell you that this pattern did not plan it. The other thing that you can see is that the center front is not straight from the lapel. And so if I was designing this jacket for women specifically with a very low bust, very wide tummy, and possibly pregnant, that would be accurate. But that's not who we were designing this for. Mm. So the next thing is I've also joined the back panel together. And you will see that the back shoulder has got no nip. So why have we got a nip on the front shoulder and not the back shoulder? I don't know. You will also see that this is clearly not a 90 degree. Mm. That's going to cause a problem. And when I have stapled the pattern together on the seam allowance, you'll notice that my armhole does not track. And so what is the machinist going to do with this step here? Mm. How are they going this armhole into the sleeve. So the next thing I'm going to do is just quickly join um, the shoulder lines together so that I can see what my armhole is going to look like. And here on the side, I'm not going to lay the patterns flat. I'm just going to join the seams together. And so here is your jacket. You can immediately see on the shoulder line 
that you have a problem with that shoulder is not refined and it does not track. And so you've got this diamond that comes out. Mm. And when you look at the shape of this jacket, just before we've even spent money on fabric or sewing it up, you can see that it looks like it's actually quite a hunched back. Mm. So then a very specific body type, low boobs, big tummy and a hunchback. Mm. Now there are people with these shapes out there, but this is not a production pattern. Mm. Next thing I would check is my two piece sleeve. And so I'm holding the two piece sleeve together. And there is a general rule that these seams would run in parallel. And so I can tell you immediately that the hang of the sleeve is too straight. And so when you are standing side on, the, the, the hang of the arm is normally curved. And so immediately I can say to you, this two-piece sleeve needs a dart out here. Mm. So the, 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 the arm actually falls forward. Mm. The next thing to be concerned about is there is no shoulder notch. So there's no notch here, there's no nip here to tell me where the center of the shoulder is. So I could set the sleeve however I want and it will hang wherever I put it. So this two-piece sleeve is a problem and I've not spent any money yet setting that sleeve. The next thing to look at is, and this is where I said the pattern maker has used a red pen here with feathered lines. This is the collar. And another rule that we will always work on is the outside circumference of a circle is larger than the inside circumference of the circle. So I can immediately tell you that this collar will never fold over without it creeping up the back neck mm. because the outside circumference isn't long enough. Mm. So I don't have to sample this collar. I can tell you already it's not gonna it's not gonna do well. The last thing is um She's given a pattern instruction for the shoulder girdle and you will pay a premium on um, jacket patterns because there are so many pattern pieces to a jacket. Is She has given an instruction here of fusing the back armhole. And so you can see she's given a dotted line saying cut fuse here. No factory has got time to go and cut and trace three centimeter outlines on armholes. That should be a separate pattern piece for the cutting room to cut without having to measure things off. The next thing that I would not be happy with is she has given me a front facing and she has given me a lining here with a dot. Now the function of a lining is the foundation of a garment. And now remember that a CMT is going to charge you for every stitch. And so why cut out a dart on the lining when the lining is foundational? What she should have done is actually just transfer the dart out here and it would be a tiny tuck over the bust which would accommodate the lateral movement. And so this is not a lining pattern. Okay. Totally, totally. Uh, waste of time, uh, a waste of, of money and absolutely unnecessary to have stitching lines in a lining. If you open up a lining on a garment, they are always very beautiful, very clean, and not mirroring the outside of the garment style lines, mm. but giving the garment a foundation and support to take the pressure off the fabric. Mm. And so that's basically how you audit a pattern. Before you've even um, paid for the pattern, you can audit that pattern there and then, and any pattern maker who's proud of their work would happily help you staple it together. And um, I also want to see um, a two centimeter line along seam lines so that I know the pattern makers put the pattern together afterwards mm. and they've tracked their own lines. Mm. Um, and that way you don't have an extra step of, of sampling a garment if you're not sure of the pattern. You've already saved yourself some money. So you recommend that people do this before they pay for the pattern and take it away from the pattern maker. You actually do it there in, in the, the pattern work. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. 
Um, and for your own self, if you've made a pattern and you're not an um, expert pattern maker, put it together before you spend money on fabric. Just glue it, you know, so and, put and it together. What would you say if you, if you go into the pattern maker and you say, look, I'd like to do this process, and then the pattern maker says to you, you don't know the first thing about patterns, um, you've got to pay me for the work I've done. Um, you're right, I might not know the first thing about patterns, but I know the first thing about my business, and this is how I'm going to conduct business. So as always, and this goes back to contracting from a coaching environment that I come from, is contract with that pattern maker saying, I don't yet know a lot, and these are the systems I would like to put into place. Are you prepared to, to um, walk with me humbly through this process? Mm -hmm. And as I say, if the ego is involved, walk away. Don't work with that pattern maker. And if that pattern maker is um, willing to walk you through the pattern, then I would also accept that that's part of their time and that they would charge me half an hour for me to audit the pattern with them. Okay. And that's fair. That's okay. absolutely fair. And, and with me, why not? And would you maybe recommend then that, that right at the start of the process, um, you have the discussion with them that when you come to pick up your patterns, you will be doing this with them and that they should then uh, factor it into their costing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And, you know, building trust is always a fantastic thing in communication cycles. Mm -hmm. And so until I lear I've learned that pattern maker, I would want to audit their patterns. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I can say to you with a good pattern maker, they know... I, in the old days, I would be able to um, make the first pattern, not even go into sampling, go into a straight grade, and they would fetch a fully <laughs> ready production pattern without even having a sample. Mm. But you know, that's about knowing that I work at that level. Mm. Um, that would be on simpler stuffs. You know, you know, if you're working with somebody like Clive Rundle, you would first sample the silhouette before we even did style lines mm. and get the silhouette right and then move into the style lines, and then we would be sampling onto um, uh, permutations of those style lines, with volume, without volume, um, yeah. So, you know, that would be a much longer process before we even got into grading. Mm -hmm. I, I actually think, if I think back to my own career when I was manufacturing clothing, I, I was always in a hurry. And it would be yeah. like, why, why do we have to make multiple samples of a thing? Can't we just get there and get into production? Um, so this is very, very interesting learning for me too. Thank you. Just to make people watching aware that it might be a longer process and that making multiple samples might be actually worthwhile to save you money in the long run. It may be a six-week process before you have a production-ready pattern that is graded to go into um, orders. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm working on, you know, a week to make the pattern, a week to sample, a week to do the fitting and corrections, another week to sample. Um, and you're often looking at three samples mm -hmm. before you can get into a week to, to grade the pattern and then um, a week to test the, the size range and then production. Mm -hmm. And not every person does size ranges and that's mm -hmm. okay. But if you're doing corporate wear, of course you would do a size range. Mm -hmm. It's much easier to send a size range to a corporate um, uh, client and have all of their staff try on a whole range of clothing to say, actually, this is how I like my fit. Mm -hmm. um, so she may be wearing her skirt a little bit looser, but it's how she enjoys wearing a skirt. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully not two sizes too small. Um, and so often we would then do a QC um, around having somebody there with the fitting range to say, actually, I recommend you to take a size larger. Mm. Um, that is not part of the, 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 the corporate look that we're looking for. Mm. In fact, one year with one of the banks, we had to write into the service level agreement for the clients to sign that they were receiving their garments, that they were not to wear our scarves as a boob tube. <laughs> um, we we love that you've got a style but please don't use the style at work and that's for coming at night um, <laughs> the 
that scarves were not to be worn as boob tubes. <laughs> That's a funny story. <laughs> if, if you can, it will happen. Oh my goodness, that's funny. I, and I bet that's not something you ever saw coming. <laughs> no, well, writing that document would have come up with the fact that maybe we should head that off at the pass. Wow. Um, but yeah, fitting ranges really are useful if you're doing corporate wear. And to have somebody go in and it's worth paying for that person's wage to actually ensure that the look and feel of that corporate brand is upheld by all of the staff members. Mm. Um, because different people will wear clothes differently. Mm -hmm. what, what also strikes me is that um, anybody who, who is making seasonal clothing should give themselves a buffer of time, a realistic buffer of time. Um, because, I mean, even, even if a, a process takes two weeks longer than you're hoping it will, can, can really mess you up. You can be late for that season. Absolutely. And then you land up launching, you know, half-baked spaghetti pie mm. and your brand is immediately affected. People mm. will remember that launch. Um, mm. And so I always say to people, you're not working on, on this season, you're working on next season, six mm. months time. Mm. And so you've got more than enough time to actually um, get your look and feel of your label and your brand and your story um, coherent. Mm. Um, and that's also where people underestimate how much it's going to cost to launch a brand mm. because you are bankrolling that for six months. Mm. Um, and we have spoken about that. You've paid cash for the fabric. You've paid cash for the patterns. You've paid cash for the CMT before mm. you've even started selling those garments. Mm. And, you know, a lot of people come to me saying, I want to sell online. You know, South Africa doesn't have the, the postal network that overseas countries have. And so from um, what I've had as research is that 60% of garments sold in South Africa online are returned. Wow. And who pays for that return? Mm. You not the client. Mm. And that's because, you know, we, we haven't been explicit enough or um, the way that we've marketed it has set up an expectation for that customer and they get the garment and they're disappointed or the garment doesn't fit. Mm. Mm. So be careful of online selling. Um, it is a way to also go out of business very quickly if you haven't got your, your structures in place correctly. Mm. Mm. That's very useful information. So, so what are, the, are mostly the reasons that the garments are sent back a bad fit? Bad fit um, because people don't know how to take their own measurements. Okay. And the size charts on the website are not accurate. They're using, um, they, that, you know, people always forget that there's a difference between body measurement and garment measurement. Hmm. So, you know, I would recommend that you, you are working with body measurement and then you know what your garment measurement is. And so then you're matching to the garment to to a person's body size mm. um you know it is easier if you've got a little bit of stretch in that garment so there's a little bit of tolerance and forgiveness um but also you know poor sewing quality um fabric quality is poor and yeah people people know what they like and they will simply return it mm. Mm. Um, um i have to say i'm um, I have not updated the, the returns since COVID-19. And so perhaps we should do an exercise on, on what is happening now with most people doing online shopping um, during COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Colleen, as always, you have been an absolute wealth of information. Um, that was a very, very useful exercise. Every time we do one of these talks, I think to myself, I wish I'd known this stuff in the 90s. <laughs> I lost so much money. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and that's why I say the kind of structures that I lecture about are so going to save you a roll of fabric. Mm. Anyone who, who is prepared to invest time in listening to these talks will save money exponentially in the long run. Mm. Mm. And we want, we want people to survive and, and more than survive, thrive. Mm. in this area. 
because it is an industry that supplies work to so many people. And so if we're talking about job creation, this is how we create jobs. We create artisans. Mm. 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 And not just in the clothing industry. Artisans of bricklayers and carpenters and bread makers. We need artisans to survive in mm. the world going. Thank you so much for your generosity to support this process. You're, you're pure gold. Thank you. Very welcome. And you too, Mal. It takes one to no one. <laughs> okay so i think that's it for our show for today and um next week we are going to be doing the q a session so for any of you who are watching who want to participate in that q a session please just uh, respond in the comments to this video and let us know so that we can send you the link and you can be a part of that zoom meetup yeah, maybe send us a couple of questions beforehand so that I can curate them um, and then we can then go to pinpointed questions also. Okay. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Colleen. Okay, cool.